Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again in the commonly accepted history of the Mexican Mafia. It is said that 1961 was a significant year because this is when the California Youth Authority became tired of the incorrigible wards that made up the young gang and shipped them off to the California Department of Corrections. Once inside the CDC, they regrouped, formalized their code of conduct, complete with death oath, and announced their presence by carrying out a series of murders, putting the convict population on notice that they wanted their issue too. Today we will take a look at a series of riots and attacks that took place at the Duval Vocational Institution in 1960 and 1961 that indeed involved some of the founding members and future members, which led to their transfer to the big time. But before we begin, a quick word from our sponsor. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In the years of 1960 and 1961, the Mexican Mafia continued to spread its power and control over the Dual Vocational Institution, continuing their self-ordained manifest destiny. In this time period, the population of DVI consisted of 62.5% white, 18.2% Chicano, 17.3% black, and 2% Native American wards and convicts. Although DVI's main goal was to house the most incorrigible CYA wards between the ages of 16 and 25 and teach them a trade, the housing strategy for the institution also included adults. The housing plan was to divide the initial 1,200 housing capacity between 800 wards and 400 adult convicts. After the construction and opening of a 309-bed guidance center on September 15, 1960, the capacity reached 1,509. The population, however, hovered around 2,000 prisoners during this time frame. On March 28, 1960, 218 wards and convicts were watching a basketball game in DVI's field house. At 8.20 p.m., a riot erupted in the bleachers surrounding the basketball court, involving an estimated 100 individuals pitting the whites and Chicanos against the blacks. The combatants utilized gym equipment, fists, chairs, weightlifting equipment, benches, and any other loose item they could get their hands on as weapons. It took staff 15 minutes to put down the riot. 31 of the participants were injured. Nine of the injured required hospital treatment, and 22 others had minor bumps and bruises from the brawl. Prison authorities blamed racial tensions present in society as the cause of the incident. This is exactly what the Emmett hoped for. They wanted to keep the new gang a secret as long as possible and conduct their moves against the rest of the prison population so the violence would appear as a result of racial tensions. According to a DVI incident report, founding members Richie Ruiz from Bakers and Eddie Potato Nose Loera from Garrity participated in this riot. Richie had just returned to DVI on December 23, 1959 after being convicted for using brass knuckles in a fight in which his fellow homeboy, Rudy Cheyenne Cadena, stabbed another young man to death with a hunting knife. Potato Nose Loera was committed to DVI for a second-degree burglary charge out of Los Angeles. Two other future Emma Carnales were also identified as having participated in this riot, David Loco Gallegos from Eloyo Maravilla and Gilbert Shotgun Sanchez from Eloyo Soto, were also identified as being involved. Gallegos would later go on to be murdered by Rene Boxer Enriquez on orders from Benjamin Topo Peters for allowing M.A. dropout Robert Huito Marquez, also from El Mara, to run him out of his neighborhood without retaliating. Shotgun Sanchez was nearly sent to Brazil by Ramon Mundo Mendoza, but Shotgun was saved when Mundo and Robert Robot Salas were following Shotgun in a separate vehicle en route to an execution when Shotgun was pulled over by police and arrested for convict in possession of firearms. On April the 15th, 1961, five DVI wards scaled a 10-foot fence that separated the Adjustment Center exercise yard from the general population recreation area. At this time, a baseball game was taking place in the main recreation yard. Once the five wards reached the main yard, they picked up baseball bats and were confronted by a group of guards, so they started swinging for the fences. 
The riot was ended with tear gas from the guard towers and the use of gas billies. Five guards were injured during the outbreak of violence. The most serious was Sergeant Barnhill, who suffered a fractured skull and was transported by ambulance to Dameron Hospital in Stockton. Officer Donald Timmons was treated at Oak Park Community Hospital for a possible dislocated shoulder. Lieutenant Ernest Coldren received head bruises. Officer Edward Corona was treated for facial cuts, and Officer Edward Martin suffered chest bruises. All three were treated and released from DVI Hospital. This incident was documented in James Carr's autobiography entitled Bad. Carr, born April 7, 1943, began his criminal career at the age of nine when he burned down his school. At the age of 10, he stabbed another child in front of hundreds of people on Easter Sunday in Hollenbeck Park. Due to his violent behavior, Carr would end up as one of the wards at DVI on April 15, 1961, when this riot unfolded. Carr wrote, The dudes in the adjustment center took the opportunity to vault the fence into the main yard. These dudes, mostly what was becoming the Mexican Mafia, had no interest in beating up cons, but were after the guards. They picked up the bats we left behind, went after a knot of guards, and fucked them up bad. On April the 28th, 1961, Eddie Potato Nose Loera, age 20, Jesus Lito Pedrosa, age 18, William Puppet McKinney, age 19, and Thomas A. Taylor, age 16, were indicted on multiple counts of assault with a deadly weapon. Founding Mexican Mafia member Potato Nose Loera was indicted on one charge of assault with a deadly weapon for the assault on Officer che Shepard. Lito Pedrosa, also a founding member, was indicted on two counts of assault with a deadly weapon for the baseball attack on guards Timmons and Corona. William Puppet McKinney, a future Aryan Brotherhood member, was indicted on four counts of assault with a deadly weapon and was alleged to be the perpetrator that fractured Sergeant Barnhill's skull. On June 12, 1961, Potato Nose was sentenced to state prison for his part in the riot. He was originally committed to DVI for second-degree burglary out of Los Angeles. The judge ordered that both sentences run concurrently. He also ordered a psychiatric examination after Potato Nose pled guilty when examining doctors reported that he may benefit from treatment. Judge Sullivan sent Potato Nose to prison with these final words. You are the only one that can help Edward Loera now. If you don't care, that's your problem, not mine. On June the 22nd, 1961, Lito Pedrosa was sentenced on two counts of assault with a deadly weapon and sent to state prison. Both Lito and Potato Nose were reunited in San Quentin when they began serving their state sentences. On May 12, 1961, Robert Crow Juarez, age 18, from Hazard Grande, was indicted for stabbing Johnson. Crow was originally committed to the California Youth Authority for car theft out of Los Angeles. He was serving a parole violation when he attacked Johnson at DVI. Crow was found in possession of a homemade knife after the riot and was placed in isolation for further investigation. On May 22, 1961, he pled guilty to assault with a deadly weapon. On June 5, 1961, Crow was sentenced to serve six months to ten years. The judge referred him back to the California Youth Authority and stated that if the CYA refused to accept him, he would be sent to state prison. DVI had enough of these young management control problems and refused to house Crow. So he was quickly transferred to San Quentin. Now let's take a look at how DVI administration responded to all the violence. On Monday, April the 17th, 1961, DVI transferred 19 DVI residents to adult facilities. The 19 included nine of the primary per perpetrators of the two weekend disturbances on April the 15th and 16th. In a misguided attempt to scare the incorrigibles from continuing their life of crime, they were transferred to Folsom Prison, San Quentin, and Soledad. They hoped that by housing the youngsters with hardened adult convicts, they would be deterred from continuing their criminal lifestyle. This would fail dramatically. Not only did the DVI transfers continue committing crimes, but they co-opted many of the men that were supposed to discourage them and recruited them into their gang. 1961 proved to be a pivotal year for the Mexican Mafia and the development of the gang. But before we continue to the adult system, 
Did these steps in the violence at DVI? Well, no. On July 1st, 1961, another baseball game was taking place on the DVI main recreation yard between the DVI team and the Stockton Amblers. A group of 12 to 15 inmates were huddled together when officers observed them. The officers, suspecting something was amiss, approached the group and asked for their IDs. The group turned on the guards and physically assaulted them. Sergeant Norman Walls was knocked to the ground and kicked, suffering an eye injury and a blow to the back of his head. He was sent home to seek treatment from his doctor. The other five were treated at the DVI hospital for bumps and bruises and released. Leighton L. Fay, age 20, was detained for assaulting the guards and was suspected of being high from inhaling an unidentified substance. DVI received him on June 2, 1961, as a result of a burglary conviction out of Santa Clara County. Fay would be indicted for his role in the assault on the guards. The only other assailant indicted along with Fay is Mexican Mafia member Raymond Tuffy Castrillo, age 20, from San Jose. The violence continued at DVI, and the decision to transfer the problem wars to other institutions inadvertently spread the Emma cancer. Please join us in our next episode where we will discuss the Mexican Mafia's arrival at San Quentin and the four murders they carried out in 11 days in December of 1961. But for now, good night and God bless.